everybody here to the Crown Court Cabana for our Discovery Series. The CF Discovery Series is sponsored by AMED and Genentech, and we really want to thank them for their support. I'm going to ask that anybody who has cell phones put them on silence or vibrate mode. And I appreciate everybody who has made a drive from long distance or has made time and busy schedules to be with us here. CF Discovery Series is a collaborative effort with Cystic Fibrosis Incorporated and Stanford. I am Carol Jenkins, Executive Director of CFRI, and with me tonight is Camille Wasowicz, who collaborated with me to create this program. As you see, we uh, have the usual high standards for cross-infection. We're lucky to have two volunteers with us today. They are Sophie and Maritza, who are happy to serve you food so that we can keep this a very safe spot. You also have signed in on a video release, and so thank you for sharing your message with people across the country. With that, I'd like to bring up Camille to introduce our speaker. Camille. Again, thanks for coming. We really appreciate your interest and involvement. This is definitely going to be an interactive conversation, lecture, discussion. CF Discovery Series, for those that are not familiar with us, was developed out of a patient's request to have a better quality of life. And when we talked to multiple patients, 75, 80 were interviewed, at an annual conference that Carol from CFRI runs, we found that there was a lot of concern about what is the best lifestyle? Several people in this room have been kind enough to present for us, whether it was on time management or if it was on dietitian requirements, stress management. And we pulled a, a listing of common concerns on how, how to do this the best possible way and what was the cutting edge technology that could provide them the best. And so we chose experts within the Stanford community to share these discussions with you. It is my privilege and pleasure to introduce Laura Free. She is a registered dietitian. She graduated from Cal State Long Beach in 2007 and did her internship at Mass General. She is currently a family medicine uh, associate professor where she does monthly lectures to the medical students she is also a very important person on our CF adult team, where she is the dietitian that manages as not only CF, but also transplant. It's with great pleasure that I introduce Laura Free. Thank you. Um, good evening, my name's Laura. I am the adult cystic fibrosis dietitian at Stanford Hospital. Um, so, the lecture tonight that I've been asked to give pertains to nutrition and cystic fibrosis and kind of how to eat healthy. Um, we're gonna talk about nutrition in CF. It gets a lot of play. Every clinic visit you go to, every hospitalization, nutrition is a component of it. Um, strategies for weight management. A lot of times weight gain is challenging um, for patients. Looking in nutrition support, different types, what is their role and function um, for nutrition and for weight management. And then questions at the end. If you have any questions throughout, feel free to raise your hand if you can, if you're afraid to forget it at the end. Um, so nutrition across the CF spectrum, more pertaining to different stages of the disease throughout the ages. Um, the main things that people know is that you need more calories daily than the average population for your age, for your gender. Um, if you have milder lung disease, you may need just a little higher, 1.2 um, times more calories than someone else your age and gender, um, all the way up to two times the daily recommended intake. Um, same for protein. Protein needs are higher as well. You need about 1.5 to two times um, the daily recommended intakes for the age. Um, the standard recommendation that everyone hears about, high calorie and high protein. Calories are our big focus. 
Um, and we also try to emphasize protein for preservation of your lean body mass and your lungs and your diaphragm or muscles and making sure that they're adequately nourished. And most of the time, usually CF centers will have a dietitian. you'll check in regularly and then we work with you guys to create um, an individualized care plan. So your CF disease is individualized to you, whether you have sinus issues, GI issues, lung issues, pancreas is various degrees of working. Um, we try and help you sort it out to keep you as healthy as possible. So what is healthy eating? It depends on your disease state, whether you have cystic fibrosis, heart failure, heart disease, diabetes. Healthy eating means different things to different people. So for cystic fibrosis, the main things we look at um, are calories. Where are your calories <laughs> come from? How many calories are you getting in per day? Are you meeting what we estimate your body's burning off each day? We look at fiber. Uh, fiber plays a big role in GI health. Do you have constipation issues? Do you have gastroparesis issues? Are you eating high fiber, low fiber? How to incorporate that to help you best manage your care? Hydration is important. Are you staying hydrated? Um, not only in times of illness when you usually become dehydrated if you're in antibiotics, but for management of constipation issues and just daily requirements, you're sweating, you're burning off um, and losing some, some fluids daily. And then vitamins and minerals. Most CF patients are very familiar with their special multivitamins that they have, their, the water-soluble form. So usually we have annual labs at your clinic visits that will check and if you need any extra supplements, we may recommend some extra vitamin D is the most common one, or some vitamin A or E. Um, and usually the, the doctor or the dietitian would make those recommendations for you. So what impacts of nutrition? Um, in terms of CF, weight's the biggest one. Whether you're a pediatric patient and we're tracking your height along the growth curve or your weight along the growth curve, um, or an adult patient where we're tracking more of your BMI and your weight trend between clinic visits, it's the big, big uh, focus for most of the doctors. And also immune function, whether you're well nourished or not, um, your body needs calories to kind of keep going every day, um, maintaining your function and lifestyle. And if you're sick or you have fevers in the hospital, usually you need more calories just to kind of help your body get through that stage in the process. Uh, your energy levels will change um, depending on your lung function. The more severe lung function usually has higher calorie needs because your work of breathing is a lot higher. So just maintaining and breathing daily, you're burning a lot more calories than the person sitting next to you. Formation of lean body mass. Um, just putting on weight requires more calories um, and a lot of nutrition and it's usually more challenging for CF patients to put on some weight. Uh, it takes a bit more effort, especially to put on some meaningful muscle mass versus fat. Uh, lung function, nutrition plays a big part. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on BMI correlation with lung function. Um, your lungs are muscles, as is your diaphragm, so making sure you're well nourished. When your body doesn't have enough nutrition, it pulls it from wherever it can. It'll break down your muscles, it'll break down your fat really quickly. And you'll notice you lose weight very quickly. Digestion, if you have any effects of digestion, whether you're pancreatic sufficient or insufficient, do you have diabetes, do you have constipation issues, um, and how nutrition can help smooth that process along. Um, and if you have any comorbidities, whether you have CF-related diabetes, do you have any renal insufficiency, do you have diabetes, all of those will affect your nutrition care plan. So for weight management, Basic, basic, basic building blocks. Diet and physical activity. Those are the two ways that you can gain weight and the two ways you can lose weight. Um, for CF, most of the time, we really emphasize weight gain. And so diet, the big thing. Calorie, physical activity, we try to encourage on a daily and weekly basis. So as we said, the energy needs change. So we're constantly, we have formulations as dietitians. We have calculations based on your height and your weight and your age. And we taking stress factors for your pancreatic sufficiency or not and your lung function. We have all sorts of stuff and we can just give you a number. Um, and that's kind of where we estimate your calorie needs are burning um, total for the day. 
And from there, that'll change depending on your disease progression, where you are in your life, how active you are. Um, so we kind of track that. Most often, you hear more about it in the hospital versus in the clinical setting, unless we're really focusing on weight gain, we may get down to the nitty gritty of numbers. Um, usually, we just like to talk about food. So for adults, um, for weight management, most doctors really focus on your BMI. Where's your BMI? Is it low, is it high? And the CF Foundation has a kind of gold standard, and these are based on looking at studies for people's FEV1s, their lung function, and their BMI. And they found a correlation where FEV1 was highest at these two different BMIs. For adults, pediatrics, they kind of trended along the weight curve. Um, BMI 23 for males, 22 for females. Any higher than that BMI kind of plateaus the lung function, and lower than that, you watch the lung function drop pretty quickly. Um, so it's a fairly steep curve down as your BMI drops, your lung function drops. And we figure that correlates to kind of muscle mass and overall nutrition um, and how well nourished you are. So if you're focusing on weight gain, the main thing we look at is your macronutrients. That would be your fats, your carbohydrates, and your proteins. And everyone with cystic fibrosis is pretty familiar with the fat foods add the most calories and I'm supposed to add it with every meal. So fat is the most dense of any of the nutrients. It has nine calories per gram. It's almost two and a change from carbohydrates and protein, which are four calories per gram. Uh, the rule of thumb, whether you're trying to gain weight or lose weight, is you need 35 extra 100 calories. So <coughs> averages about 500 extra calories a day to gain weight. You need to lose weight, 500 extra calories cut out of your daily intake. And then you can go up from there if you want to gain two pounds a week, then you need 7,000 extra calories over the course of the week, which is a lot of additional calories to try and pack in, um, which is why weight gain is very challenging. Your basic needs just with lung function, keep your body going, activity every day is 2,500, 3,000 calories, and then asking you to eat an additional 3,500, it's a lot, which is why we have a dietitian who works with you and tries to help you out. So in a clinic setting or in the hospital, usually we try and work with the patient and the family to figure out how to help you best gain some weight. The main emphasis is usually on calorie dense foods, so we really focus on how to get the most bang for your buck. What's the most nutrient dense item you can eat? Because a lot of times it can be pretty daunting when you see a spread of three times the servings of entrees plus like four beverages and some sides and then we ask you to eat everything because that's a thousand calories. It's pretty overwhelming to do. So we focus on getting some nutrient dense foods in and kind of spacing the meals throughout the day is a lot easier for people to handle, especially if you're having um, more issues with breathing, you're more short of breath. It's a lot easier to eat smaller meals throughout the day, maybe kind of alternating between solid food and then have a liquid supplement in between. Um, just to help with work of breathing, it's really hard to chew and breathe at the same time, um, let alone eat a large quantity of food. It may take a really long time to finish a meal. So we encourage small frequent meals and eating every two to three hours. It gets a little tricky if you have diabetes because then it can kind of trend towards grazing, which is hard to cover with insulin. So if you have CF diabetes and you're trying to snack more frequently, <coughs> spacing it out at least two hours apart to give your insulin time to peak and come down before you stack, so you don't stack your insulin on top of each other. Um, high calorie beverages, most people are pretty familiar with drinking the whole milk or having the juices, anything with a lot of calories for a smaller quantity. Um, nutrition supplements, big market for cystic fibrosis patients, whether it's Insure or Boost or Carnation, Scandi shakes, anything that has a lot of calories for an eight ounce can is pretty desirable. And then you can drink it with your meal, you can drink it on the run. It's easier to get calories in drinking than it is to try and eat something. And they can do appetite stimulants. Um, usually these are prescribed by a nurse practitioner or the doctor. If kind of all of the top things fail, before we go to nutrition support and you see they're really struggling with eating, doesn't, the appetite's not quite there, um, you can add an appetite stimulant. It works for some people really well, other people not so effective. So those are generally left to the discretion of the doctor to kind of add to your medicine regimen. Um, and nutrition support 
kind of the final stage where if you're just really struggling and you need some help, then we have that as an option. And it's very effective. So some high calorie food sources. Um, the big ones, they're all very fat dense because that is the most nutrition bang for your buck. Um, these are, the top half is more the heart healthy versions that have the omega-3 and the omega-6, which have some anti-inflammatory properties. Um, so oils often added to meals, avocado easily added to milkshakes or food, nuts, seeds, as long as you don't have any nut allergies, peanuts and other nut butters, um, fatty fishes are always good, uh, fatty meats, soybeans, tofu, whole milk is a common one, half and half, heavy whipping cream, ice creams, any of the high fat dairy, um, as well as cheeses and butters are, are easy stuff. And all these are things that, um, minus the tofu and fish and meat, things that can be added to your meals to add some extra calories in. So in general, some eating tips to focus on the calories. That's really, at the end of the day, whether it comes from carbohydrates or protein or fat, you're just trying to get enough calories in to keep your body weight and to prevent your body from breaking down any sort of muscle and fat. So having nutrient-dense food item with each meal and snack. So if you really love chips or you really love cookies, just make sure you have like a sandwich with it or maybe a protein shake, something else that's gonna sustain your body. And then you can get the additional calories from the cookie or the chips or whatever else, the soda. Um, and also creating a balance between protein and carbohydrates. Important for diabetes, this is, will delay the gastric emptying, so it kind of creates a satiety effect. Um, works well for weight management. Um, but for you guys um, with cystic fibrosis, it's important to kind of balance out your diet. And it's not so top heavy with fat that you're just constantly eating a bunch of fat. Um, you're getting protein in for your muscles, you're getting the carbohydrates in, because carbohydrates are your body's initial preferred source of energy. So they prefer the carbohydrates, then they'll kind of go for the protein and the fats. So getting a variety in and kind of balancing it out um, is preferred. And then frequency of meals. Smaller amounts more often, it's usually easier to get in the calories. And then reading the food label. Um, Similar to any other standard person looking at a food label, you're gonna look at the calories. You wanna see how many calories are in there. Um, fat, obviously, prefer to have a good fat source. Making sure it has some protein, some carbohydrates, and higher quantities of each of the four items per serving. So making sure that there's adequate nutrition in each serving, kind of checking it out. If you need to go the route of nutrition support, um, when to consider it? So the main thing um, that doctors and the dietitian and the medical team will look for is if the patient's failure to thrive. And that most often refers like in infants, you think that they're not growing properly, which is the same effect. Weight gain's not there. If it's a pediatric patient, they may be falling off the growth curve and they're not growing as tall, their weight's not coming on as quickly. Um, in the adult population, usually they're losing weight steadily over a period of months and they, we've maxed out all the other options. They're drinking supplements, they're eating as much as they can, maybe they're on an appetite stimulant, and we just can't figure out any other reason or way to help them. Um, and for a lot of people, by the time they're about when ready for nutrition support, food's just not pleasurable. It's very challenging, it's a struggle for them, and so this is a way to give them some extra support. So the two options are enteral nutrition versus parenteral nutrition. Um, enteral nutrition most often seen for cystic fibrosis patients, um, and that's tube feeds. And a lot of people have tube feeds at various stages in their life. Um, and it's fairly common to have tube feeds as a pediatric patient for a while to kind of get you over a growth hump um, or as an adult patient, as your lung function declines and your calorie needs increase. So, and it takes the pressure off eating, is the main thing that we look for in any sort of nutrition support regimen. It kind of gives you a security blanket, it takes the pressure off, because you have to focus on doing your meds, doing your chest therapy, everything else in your life, that this is a little cushion for you. So usually, um, the dietitian and the doctor would create an individualized regimen based on 
your lifestyle, your day, how you want to set it up. Most people prefer to run their tube feeds if they have tube feeds um, at nighttime is easiest for them. Um, when they go to bed, they're sleeping, they don't feel it, they don't notice it. Some people prefer to run it during daytime. If they sit at a computer all day and they're just working, they would prefer to run it daytime. Um, so it's all individualized. And then we pick formulas kind of based on your medical history. Do you have diabetes? How severe is your pancreatic insufficiency? Do you have any other food intolerances? Um, we try and look at the whole picture. So when we give you a nutrition support prescription, um, you can pick a regimen, and usually that's kind of worked out with the medical team, but mainly you, when you go home, you're in charge of your own nutrition support. You can run it anytime you want, and we can't tell you any differently. Um, so most people cycle it. They run it over a certain number of hours. Um, nighttime is very common. Daytime is also an option. And continuous, most often seen in a hospital setting, um, it means you're running it 24 hours a day and you constantly have a tube feed attached to a pole um, and a pump's running. Uh, continuous, not as common at home, but definitely in a hospital or an ICU setting, we would use it. And bolus feeds often people do if you have a feeding tube. Um, instead of a meal, if you're just not hungry in the morning, when you wake up, breakfast is a struggle, you can give yourself a couple cans and usually if you have a pump or you can use a syringe and it's an easy way for them to get in calories short period of time instead of eating a meal they can just give themselves a bolus 